Chow, your host and producer of Free Our Voices. This week's show, we're out here in Cambridge for the annual Peace Action Meeting. And today's guest speakers will be Phyllis Bennis. She'll be speaking of the Syrian war, ISIS, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the U.S. So stay tuned for a highly informative and light so thank you so much everyone for making time for the Mass Peace Action annual meeting this year. We have a great program prepared today. Um, and uh, so the, but the first person I'm going to call to the stage is, uh, to welcome us to Cambridge, is the Mayor of Cambridge, Denise Simmons, who is also a member of Mass Peace Action Board of Directors. I often start with great morning for two reasons. Good morning is sort of regular and ordinary. And great morning really means something special. And I think that I don't know if you've been watching television lately, but what I see, particularly for the, are there any Donald Trump supporters here? Uh, no, but I met him. But you met him? Yeah. Well, I'll pray for you. <laughs> it really bothers me, friends. It worries me. The work that we're trying to do, and here's this person that's being elevated to a level that I, six months ago, I would have never thought would happen. But it makes me reflect on that and what we need to do to offset what he is doing and what he has engaged people in, the violence, the, the, all the isms that are coming up and the anti that's coming in. We want America to be America again. What does that mean? <laughs> mighty, mighty army. As Martin Luther King talks about, one drop makes a very big waterfall. And we want to be a waterfall for peace. Good work this, today. With this, I would like to introduce Phyllis. Thank you, Sheila, and thank all of you for coming out today on this rather extraordinary day. I gotta say, if I lived in Boston, I think I'd be outside. So thank you all. Thanks to MAPA for having the fortitude to continue to come out. We have a lot of work to do, a lot of work ahead, but you're what make it possible. And I just want to add one other thing. I'm really honored today to be speaking along with Congressman Jim McGovern, who I know is your representative, but we get to work with him as well in D.C. And in D.C., we need him a lot. <laughs> There's not as much there um, as having a mayor who would be part of peace action. That's kind of an extraordinary thing. What a privilege that is. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Simmons, for, for being here, for being part of this. But just know what a privilege it is. It's a reflection of the work that you all do, no doubt. But it still is a huge privilege to have elected officials who will sit in a room with us <coughs> to talk about these issues. So cherish that. I'm, I'm very grateful. I wanted to start this morning with a, uh, a sense of anniversaries. You know, this is uh, coming up this week is the 13th anniversary of the Iraq War from 2003. Looking around the room, and this is not always something to be proud of, but one part we should be proud of is that I think most people here were out in the streets on February 15th, 2003, the day the world said no to war. And the global movement remains, remains with us. We're also coming on to, well, we've just passed, actually, the 25th anniversary of the first Gulf War that set the stage, in many ways, for the creation of ISIS, the, the launch of the global war on terror, still going on by a different name, what we're now seeing in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen. It, it's a rising war, and it was rooted in these earlier wars. I was looking up last night what are the anniversaries for March 12th? Today's March 12th, so I'm looking at So what are the anniversaries? The first 10 anniversaries that you get when you look at, you know, when you Google anniversary for March 12th, seven out of 10 are wars, starting in 538 AD. 
it's one of the early Roman wars, and going right up through the Civil War. And that's just up through the Civil War. Seven out of 10 are about wars. So we have to think about that. The, one of the other anniversaries, though, is that March 12th was also the beginning, the launch of Gandhi's March to the Sea, the Salt March. So we have a great model to pose against those wars that have been so prevalent on this day. Let me start with some words from a, a friend of mine, a great analyst in Washington of all places, uh, a former ambassador of the US, Chaz Freeman, in an article he wrote a few days ago. And he said this, the United States has now been engaged in a cold war with Iran for 37 years. It has conducted various levels of hot wars in Iraq for 26 years. It has been in combat in Afghanistan for 15 years. Americans have bombed Somalia for 15, Libya for five, and Syria for one and a half years. One war has led to another. None has yielded any positive result, and none shows any signs of doing so. The same might be said of the other wars we Americans subsidize and supply. Israel's wars to subdue the Palestinians and deter other Arabs from challenging its ongoing dispossession of them are now 68 <coughs> years old and counting. U.S. drones have been killing Yemenis for 14 years, Pakistanis for 12, and Somalis for none. Saudi Arabia's bloody effort to reinstall an ousted government in Yemen is almost a year old. In none of these wars is an end in sight. Massive violence does not require war. We have been at war with terrorism for 15 years, and terrorism is doing just fine. That's the problem. We need something else. Not to walk away and say, ah, we don't care about terrorism, it's not our issue. It's everybody's issue. But we need to have other ways. You can't bomb terrorism out of existence. Because you can't bomb terrorism. You can only bomb people. Sometimes you might get lucky and hit terrorists instead of children. Sometimes you get lucky. But that doesn't work to end terrorism. It simply creates different terrorists, the children of the ones that you killed, their neighbors, their friends. So we have to be very clear. We were, I was talking just now with someone here about what makes ISIS strong. I don't believe that ISIS is strong because the individuals in that organization are so committed or such skilled terrorists. Some of them may be. Some of them may be obsessed with death or obsessed with killing. Clearly, some of them are. But that's not why they are strong. They're strong because of where they get their support. And they get their support, unfortunately, from a wide range of people and forces who don't believe in their extremist version of Islam. People like the mainly Sunni generals of the Saddam Hussein era in Iraq, who are, these guys, I've met some of them, they are very secular. They drink, they smoke, whatever. But they're prepared to ally themselves with ISIS, and more importantly, more dangerously, put themselves and their military skills at the service of ISIS, not because they believe in a caliphate, these are very modern generals, but because they see ISIS as not only a lesser evil than the sectarian Shia-dominated government in Baghdad that we put in power and pay and arm, but is far more accountable, ironically, to Iran than they are to us, but they see ISIS as a tool to challenge that government because they don't see any other option. And that, so that's the challenge that we face. The result of 15 years of a war against terrorism is Afghanistan, where this, the, the uh, Special Inspector General has, has just said in testimony to Congress about two or three weeks ago that the Taliban now controls more territory than at any time since the U.S. first attacked Afghanistan and overthrew the Taliban in 2001 and where our, our signature accomplishment was that at least all the children are now in school. Turns out to be a lie. Because of one, corruption. There were, you see if I remember the numbers right, it was $117 billion that the US has spent on education in Afghanistan since 2001. And as a result of that, 13 billion has simply disappeared. They just don't know where it ended up, just in one three year period. But aside from that, 42% of the children of Afghanistan of grade school age are either 
have either never been to school or have been forced to drop out of school before finishing the fifth grade because they have to go to work or their school has simply collapsed and there are no teachers. So this claim that, well, at least the children are in school, at least the girls are in school, simply isn't true. That's what 15 years of the war against terrorism has brought. In Syria, a war against ISIS, a war against terrorism, has led to a situation where ISIS still has hundreds of thousands of people under its control. ISIS still controls territory and cities. The regime in Damascus, an incredibly brutal regime, is still in power. The so-called Free Syrian Army with US weapons is committing war crimes of its own. And the incredibly brave, principled, original political opposition in Syria, those who have survived this long, not many of them have. Many have been killed. Many were driven into exile. Many have been wounded. Many have gone and joined the armed opposition and have ended up in either extremist or non, not so extremist forces of their own. But those few who remain the political opposition, they've been out this week. Have you seen those incredible videos of people raising the flag of the political opposition in cities that for the first time, there's no barrel bombs being, bombed, that being dropped. There's no free Syrian army attacks on their people. They're able to go into the streets just at this moment because for the moment, this non-ceasefire cessation of hostilities is still holding. That's huge. And it speaks to the incredible bravery of people in Syria. It doesn't mean that the US has not been trying for years to change regimes. But I think it does speak to how we have to understand that with a great deal of nuance and with a great deal of respect for people in Syria. In the same way, we have to look at our own responsibility in Iraq for giving rise to ISIS. ISIS doesn't arise out of the blue. Now, how many of you have heard this line about ISIS started, I'm not asking if you believe it, just whether you've heard it. ISIS started when President Obama pulled the troops out of Iraq in 2011. How many of you have heard that? All right, and the rest of you are lying. You know. <laughs> but it's wrong. ISIS didn't start in 2011 when President Obama pulled out the troops. It started in 2004 when President Bush had 150,000 U.S. troops in Iraq. And it started because of those 150,000 troops occupying Iraq and the fact that we had arrested thousands of Iraqis and others on the ground, on the battlefield, and off the battlefield, and we're imprisoning them. This is the moment, remember Abu Ghraib, the scandal before Guantanamo? Not everybody in those prisons, in those US prisons like Camp Buka, not everybody was tortured, thankfully. But everybody heard about the torture and the humiliation and the photographs that went viral all around the world. And it was at that time that a few people, led by the guy we now call Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, who happened to be in prison in a US prison in Camp Buka, pulled together a few people and created the organization that became ISIS. So the history of ISIS, I'm not going to go through the whole history now, it's in the book, um, and why it's changed its name so many times. When it started, it wasn't called ISIS. It was, called the, the, it was first called the Islamic State in Mesopotamia all the time, no one wants war. <coughs> Not true. No one where the war is being fought wants war. But the people far away who are profiting from war, oh, they want war. They want war very, very badly. Those who profit, who we bono, who benefits, is always the right question to ask. The military contractors in the United States, the CEOs of those giant corporations, they want this war. And we're paying the price. Massachusetts alone, thank you to Northampton's great National Priorities Project. Do you all know the National Priorities Project? One of our great resources. Great cheat sheets anywhere you're speaking. Go, always go there the night before. So I went to their site the night before, last night. Massachusetts alone, just since August of 2014, just in the so-called war against ISIS, not talking about Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and all the other wars we're fighting, not talking about the drone war, not talking about Somalia and Yemen, just the war against ISIS, $202 million. Now imagine what you could do, $202 million here at home, if, if you had access to that. You could have had 10 years 
of having 1,460 kids in Head Start and in their intelligence agencies have all said that despite the political back and forth, President Obama has been the most pro-Israeli president in history. Because they don't base their assessments on, on the basis of how warm and fuzzy the visits are at the White House. They base their assessments on how much money does the U.S. give to the military, how consistently is the U.S. prepared to defend Israel in the United Nations so that Israeli officials are never held accountable for their potential war crimes, and how much is the U.S. prepared to look the other way when the violations continue. And then people say, oh my God, Obama is throwing Israel under the bus. Well, there was no bus. Remember in the summer of 2010 when Netanyahu came and there was that really difficult conversation between Obama and Netanyahu? And Netanyahu was lecturing Obama in this incredible, really racist dynamic, I can't say any other word than that, treating him like an errant schoolboy. And in that conversation, President Obama fought back and said, you've got to stop building settlements. And the answer was, no. And he repeated, you need to stop building settlements. Answer, no. And then the question stopped. The request stopped. Now, real pressure would have been, you got to stop building settlements. Answer, no. Okay, you're an independent country. You can do what you want. But you know that $3.1 billion we give you every year? You can kiss that goodbye. And you know how, you know how we defend you in the U.S.? We're not going to do that anymore. Now, in fact, that's not even pressure. That's just eliminating a gift, right? That's just starting to go back to normal. Now, the important thing about this is that the discourse has changed massively in this country. The Prime Minister of Israel coming to address a joint session of Congress. Imagine 60 members of Congress publicly, including one sitting at the back of the room, agreeing to skip the speech. Imagine that. We would never have seen that. If not for the